It was the Sunday after July 4th of 2009 that I shared this message with the church in Traverse City that I was pastoring. And I began it by asking everyone, get up and move one seat forward. Some of you just began smiling. I'm not going to make you do that this morning. What was funny is I always had a couple that sat right here in the front row. And for that Sunday, they had actually sat over on this side. And they were so upset at that point. Like, we sit over there every single week, and the first time we ever move to the other side, you have us move. And they laughed it off and moved over. There was a guy in the back, about three rows in from the back. He would always sit there, he and his wife, and the people behind him were confused because they didn't want to sit on his lap. But he refused to get up. And for many years, he was a grumpy old man. Until one day on a Saturday morning, he called me up out of the blue and said, Pastor, and I braced myself. He said, I just want to apologize for the way that I've treated you the last several years. It was wrong, and I'm seeking your forgiveness. And there was such a change in Bill that day. And for the rest of my time there, it was a joy, and I looked forward to seeing Bill every Sunday instead of, how do I shake hands and just figure out how not to set him off? Well, last week, we began asking about the best question ever. And we began by saying that all of us make mistakes. All of us have Seasons in our life, decisions we've made that we wish we could go back and undo. We have regret. Whether it's money we blew, money we lost, people we treated the wrong way, jobs we accepted that we never should have, invitations to go places we never should have. There's things that we've all done that we wish we had never done. And what we discovered last week is that God has given us a tool to foolproof our lives and to to not have to do those mistakes. So we dug into a a short passage of Scripture, three verses. I'll put them up on the screen. And Ephesians 5, 15 to 17 says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And out of all of that, as we studied it, what we discovered is that there is a question that if we would have the boldness to ask it in all the areas of our lives, things could go different. The best question ever is what is the wise thing for me to do? You see, too often we ask the wrong kind of question. We ask what is the moral thing or what is permissible in society standards or according to the laws of the land. What's everybody else doing? We ask as believers, well, does the Bible have something to say about this subject? And all kinds of times, as a pastor, you get to hear those kinds of questions. People will come up and ask, well, Pastor, what does the Bible have to say about stem cell research? And the Bible doesn't say anything specifically about stem cell research because it wasn't a topic of discussion back at the time that God's Word was written. And so for many people, they will go through life with the approach that as long as the Bible doesn't have a verse against it, if there's not a thou shall not, then it must mean that thou shall. And they'll go at it with all of their energy and all of their money and everything they've got. With gusto, they go towards it. But is that the question that God wants us to live by? Is that the standard that as dearly loved children of God that he wants us to live by? And the promise we get from his word is that there's an altogether different question that he wants us to ask. 
What's the wise thing for me to do? And in fact, we talked last week that there's three ways of looking at the question to help us form in our minds what is the wise thing. We said, in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? And if you'll form the question that way, it changes everything. People will ask, well, is it okay to drink alcohol? They'll ask, is the, you know, does the Bible say we shouldn't drink alcohol? And if you've been part of the United Brethren Church for years, you know that things have changed. The UB Church was always known as a dry denomination. In fact, all kinds of family battles have formed over people who bought cough syrup and would go out late at night and have to try to search for one that didn't have alcohol in it because they knew if, if somebody else found out, then alcohol was a test of membership. You couldn't drink alcohol at all and still be a member of the Church of the United Brethren in Christ. And about 10 years ago, that stance changed. Does the Bible say we shouldn't drink alcohol? Well, the Bible does say we shouldn't get drunk. Old and New Testament, the Bible says we shouldn't get drunk. But does it say we shouldn't drink alcohol? No. It never says that you should not drink alcohol at all. But if we approach it asking that question all the time, does the Bible have a specific verse against this? Then we're missing it because there's so many subjects that the Bible doesn't speak specifically to. But if you ask the question this way, in light of your past experience, in light of your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams, is the wise thing to do to drink alcohol? People push back and say, well, th that's, that's not what I'm asking. I mean, I want to know, does... Does the Bible have a verse against it? We don't want to go there. Because too often we already know what the answer is. And we get the question in all kinds of ways. People come after being in a marriage and they're divorced and they're, they're dating and they, they kind of want to assume that it's okay to have sex. You know, well, does the same thing that applies to me, you know, is that the same thing that applied back when I was a teenager? I mean, come on, I'm 30-something, and hey, you know, it's already happened, so, you know, does, does the Bible say I, I, we shouldn't? And again, we're asking the question the wrong way when we approach life that way. If you're to ask the question, in light of my past, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams. Is sex outside of a committed marriage a wise thing? When has sex outside of marriage ever been the thing that led to your future hopes and dreams? You see, it's a different way of looking at life. And it's the way that God wants you and I to approach life. That's just... Two simple examples, because it happens at all stages of life. Now, here's the thing. As I began talking about those simple examples, you had probably one of three reactions. And they're represented by these three chairs here today. So I want to teach you this morning about what God says about wisdom, but what he says about it on the other side of it. And we're going to take a look at Proverbs this morning. You had one of three reactions. The first reaction, we'll call that chair number one over here. And in chair number one, when I begin talking about not drinking or not having sex, your, your reaction is that I sound like an overbearing parent. You know, you remember those conversations, you came home from a date and your parents started talking about 
pregnant. You're like, I just went out on a date. When we begin to talk about things like this and asking the question a different way, you kind of think of that sounding like an overbearing parent. That's chair number one. Chair number two, when you hear things like that, your reaction is different. Your reaction is, you know, preacher, you're probably right. And I'm not going to argue that drinking's not the wise thing to do or that I shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. But to be really honest with you, I just don't care. I mean, you can argue about it, and I'm not going to. But just to be honest with you, I don't care. I mean, I've read the warning labels, and I know that smoking's not good for me, and drinking too much ain't good for me, but I just don't care. I think somehow it's going to work out for me. I don't know, I just, I think it's gonna work out for me. And some of you are smiling because you've got friends like this and you can call them by name. And then there's the third chair. And the third chair, well, you're a lot like chair number two. But chances are there's not very many of you sitting in this chair. So we'll just kind of make an example out of this one this morning. I mean, if it rains outside, they're probably not in church. But chair number three, they kick it up a notch from chair number two. Because not only will they say, I don't agree with you. I, I, I'm not going to argue that my way is the wise way in that. But if you're sitting right here, you're probably saying this morning, you know, preacher, that's what I would expect from a right-wing, evangelical, conservative pastor from a United Brethren Church. You guys are dangerous in your narrow-minded approach to life. I mean, you need to get with it. These, This is way past 2000. This isn't decades and centuries ago when we didn't know nothing. And you're ready to, for the first time, write on your connection card and tell me a little something. You're ready to preach me a little sermon. It's not okay just to hear it and say, I don't care. But you got an opinion. You got a case that you've made. And you're ready to argue it. You're already ready as soon as you get in the car to ride home with the people to try to undo everything I'm about to say in the next few minutes. That's chair number three. Now the funny thing is, this book that I've got up here, this book called the Bible that I read from every single day that all of us should be reading, but we, if we're honest, we probably spend more time on Facebook or Twitter or reading the news banner than we do that every day because we think that they're more interesting or might help us out more. That book written by 40 different authors that God used over thousands of years has described... These three people, it's described in advance what their response is going to be, how to identify them. It even talks about what's the solution. So this morning, I want to introduce you to what God's Word says in Proverbs about these three people. Over here in chair number one, God's Word calls them the naive. The naive. We're going to talk probably the most about them, the naive. The naive approaches life like, I'm going to figure it out. Chair number two, Proverbs describes them as the fool. And nobody ever wants to be called the fool. We try to soften all kinds of things in life by putting an ish on the end. I can't be too direct and say I'm going to make it there at 5 for dinner. I'll be there at 5-ish. I want to give myself a little bit of room and not be too specific. So we'll say that somebody is acting foolish, but rarely will they call them 
the fool is something we'll never call ourselves. The last chair, the one who isn't satisfied by just saying, I don't care, but the one who's going to tell you all about it, the one that you're on pins and needles being around, Proverbs calls them the scoffer or the mocker. And so this morning, I want to teach you about how to deal with these three, and specifically, if you'd be bold enough to admit that you're one of them. Now, I don't mean that you're that way in every area of life, but all of us have sat in each one of these chairs to some degree and in some areas of our lives. This morning, I want to teach you how to get up and move. Before I do that, I've got a little video to lighten the mood before we begin talking about the naive. Whoa, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> well, there's nothing else left to do. Is it? See, the thing is with the naive, if you are one, you won't admit it. Nobody ever looks in the mirror and says, you know, my problem is I'm just too naive. And the flip side of it is, if you ever figure it out, you won't be one anymore. See, the naive person approaches life different. They can't see because they don't have the experience. The scriptures say that the naive person lacks judgment. Now, we think about Solomon being wise. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge means I know of things already, and to be wise or to have wisdom means I'm able to make judgments about something. And the naive person simply lacks judgment. They lack the ability. That's why so many times it sounds like a put-down. It's not meant to be. Because the naive person lacks judgment. They think they can figure life out on their own. And it has huge ramifications for how they approach everything. And if you're beyond the naive person, you can see things that they simply can't see. It's not a put down and it's not your fault. You just lack experience. You lack experience. The naive person, here's who you are. You are a middle schooler. You are a high schooler. You're a college freshman. You're somebody who's 25, maybe 29. And there's things that you simply haven't experienced yet. And so you approach life thinking you can figure it out all on your own. And all the people who have tried to speak into your life just sound like, nah, 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 nah. And you don't want to hear because you haven't had the experiences that others have. I mean, it explains so much of why kids can do things. We just scratch our heads and say, why? We've tried to tell you, but why do you do this over and over? They've heard us say, you should know better. This is going to hurt your life. But for them, they just want to try to figure it out on their own. They lack experience. And it's not meant to be a put-down. To a large degree, you simply 
can't help it because you simply haven't experienced enough of life yet to be able to make those kinds of decisions. And all of you can be nodding your head. You see people like this. The older you are, the more that you've seen of this. As a naive person, you wish so desperately. You could at times just take them and shake them. Oh, if I could just get you to see this. The problem is when somebody wise speaks into your life, you think they're like an overgrown parent. They're just overreacting. Proverbs 7 describes the simple or the naive person. And the story begins like this. At the window of my house, I looked out through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the youth, a young man who lacked judgment. It's the naive person. They lack judgment. They can't see what's going to happen because they haven't been there before. As you may know, the story goes on. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house at twilight. As the day was fading, as the dark of night set in, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. They have a conversation. I'm not going to put all the words up on the screen. It's a dirty chapter. And throughout this encounter, the guy who is watching this perceives this in an altogether different way than the young man who lacks experience. He's walking up and saying, this is great! This is going to be so awesome for my life! And the guy with wisdom who can see this knows this is going to be one of the worst mistakes of his life. And the story ends this way. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. There's where you get that phrase from. Like an ox going to the slaughter. He doesn't understand. He doesn't have the experience to know when someone else takes that kind of interest in him just what's going to happen. And the problem is, at certain stages of life, we all lack experience. And we lack judgment. I mean, think about it. Many of you were college freshmen at one point. And you remember being bombarded by credit card offers. You remember saying, oh man, somebody finally trusts me. Look at what they're willing to trust me with. And the problem is, you had never woken up one morning to being $25,000 in debt and felt that kind of burden. So it made sense to you to apply for all of the credit cards and therefore the free pizza and t-shirts and CDs that you could get. It just made sense because of your lack of experience. That's why middle schoolers and high schools, high school students smoke cigarettes and other things. From their limited experience, they think it's cool. And just let me share with those of you who are seeing this. No adult goes by the school and sees you standing over at the corner smoking together and says, Oh, honey, <laughs> look at little Tommy over there. Isn't he cool? I mean, isn't he so grown up? Why? Oh, I wish I was that grown up when I was his age. No adult sees that and thinks, Wow, that's really cool. We're thinking, you've never coughed part of your lung into your hand before. You've never had a doctor tell you 
that could be hurting your unborn baby. You've never had those life experiences yet, so of course to you, you think it's a cool idea. You think it's a great idea. You see, it happens at all ages of life. Sometimes it happens even to senior citizens. You spent the last decades of your life with people who have cared for you. You've been surrounding yourself with people who seem to have your best interests in mind. And when you're bombarded by the telemarketers, who seem to know when you've reached a certain age to, to ramp it up, and you're offered all kinds of Medicaid supplements or offers to help people around the world with different needs, you think that these must be honest people on the other end, and if I give my money to this, they're going to really help me. You've not had the experience of somebody trying to take everything you've got. You see, it happens in all phases of life. There are times where we've lacked experience in that one area. And that's why for teenagers and people in their young 20s, well, they think that sex outside of marriage is a good thing. They think, well, it feels good. Nobody else got hurt, so why not? And they've never had to have that conversation with the one that they really are going to marry. And they've never had that conversation with their kids where you get done telling them the things that you want them to do in life and they turn to you and say, well, is that how you handled it? They've never had those conversations before. They've never had the experience. So, of course, it makes sense to them. Solution is suggested in the Bible, and I want you to to take note of this, particularly if you are a naive person, you're just starting to think, maybe I am. There's a solution. And the problem is we have to stop looking at life as though I'm going to solve it all on my own. And it has a relationship with Jesus Christ as a solution. Here's the kind of thing you need to say. God, you are God and I am not. And even though I don't understand, I don't agree, and think that you're overreacting, I trust you. Even if I'm the only one and others think I'm stupid. And that's why I love working in youth ministry. That's why so many spend so many hard days and rough questions with middle schoolers and teenagers. Because it is possible to get it right the first time. We don't have to live a life of regret. And they're at such a crucial age. But if we can help them to see this, God, you're God, and I'm not. And even though I don't understand it, I don't agree with it, I'm willing to do the tough thing and trust you. And even if my friends think I'm a fool because of it, I believe that you have my best interests in mind, God. So help me to stop being the naive person. That's the solution. Now the second category, the second chair, is what Scripture call the fool. Now I want to set this up with one more little video clip, and it's of a pastor. He was a pastor at a church in Grand Ledge. It was a new church plant. Very innovative guy. They bought a old bank in downtown and it was full nine foot glass windows in the front of it and they started off just having Sunday evening services and eventually had Sunday morning services and everybody in town saw what was going on and he used this video to um, set something up this was not scripted this was somebody happened to have a camera one day where they were just messing around I do it before Lori comes. <laughs> she won't let us play anymore. Oh. See, now my head won't fit in every because my head is much bigger than yours. I don't do it, I'm gonna feel really stupid. <laughs> I can't break that. Well, soft two by four. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I gotta try it one more time now. Cause I think I can do it. I gotta remember not to have my tongue sticking out. I don't wanna bite my tongue. Oh, I went through it. <laughs> okay, I heard a couple cracks. <laughs> I just do it right. Oh, I did it right, but it really hurts. <laughs> Gordon Kettle actually showed that to his own church. Uh, if I did something that dumb and somebody caught it on tape, I'm not sure if I would share it with you. But what he did say was this. He said, even smart people do dumb things every now and then. We've all played the part of the fool now and then. The fool knows the difference between right and wrong. But frankly... I just don't care. Now, the naive person, when they sit here long enough, the Bible pretty much says what you don't know can kill you. If you won't begin to ask the question of what's the wise thing to do, if you're not willing to get out of the chair, it can kill your relationships. It can kill your opportunities. It can even physically kill you. This guy over here, well, it can kill him too. And our problem is the way that we approach the fool. We think that if we can just pass on more information to the fool, if we can just finally get them to see it our way and to see it God's way, that they'll finally just wisen up and realize this ain't working out. It doesn't work that way. Proverbs 10.23 says that a fool finds pleasure in evil conduct, but a man of understanding delights in wisdom. They find pleasure in evil conduct. They like what they're doing. Even if it causes harm. They've determined that that's enough harm that I can live with and get away with. So our arguments to try to help them see the other side, they don't want to hear it. They've already heard it. Proverbs 26.11 says, As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. I had a cocker spaniel growing up. That dog lived on a chain, a miserable life out in the backyard. We got him when I was about three years old. When I was in the seventh grade, my sister got a cat. The cat got to live inside and outside, and Sparky roamed the house. When it was really cold in the winter, we would finally at times put a litter box in the family room. And Sparky pretty much went out all the time, but there was one particular winter I remember. It got really, really cold, so we broke down and got a litter box, and Sparky would go in the back room. And there was one night it was so cold that we brought Freckles, our dog, in the house. Sensitive stomachs, cover your ears. That dumb dog went over and started eating cat litter. And a few moments later, he was throwing up all over in the litter box. But the dog was so dumb that minutes later, he went right back to doing it again. And it's the picture of the fool in your life. They keep going back and doing it over and over and over again. And you're looking at it and saying, how can you be so dumb? But they find humor in it. They think, only if I could make some money on this on a TV show. Boy, if I could get a million hits on this in YouTube. If I could star in an MTV show for this. And they just approach life in a totally different way than the wise person does. They think that it makes sense. And what's the Bible say is the solution? How do you really deal with a fool? Well, the problem is 
you probably can't. And if you've tried, you know this. A fool has to hit rock bottom before they finally begin to look up. And you pray that bottom comes soon enough and it's not too far down. But if you've dealt with the fool in your life, or if you've been the fool and you're bold enough to admit it, you know that the only way is to hit rock bottom. And you have to learn the hard way. Now the good news is that we don't all have to learn the hard way. We can take our cues from other people who have learned the hard way. We all have people we know who have drunk themselves out of friends. Who have gambled themselves out of everything. Who have treated so many so harshly that nobody wants to be around them anymore. We've all had to deal with the fool and solution. They have to learn the hard way. But if you're the fool here this morning and you're hearing this same preacher, you're probably right. Here's the thing that you refuse to think about. The real issue is that he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. You go through life and you say, well, it's my choices, and if I want to live that way, I have the right to live that way. And the problem is you're not thinking about anybody else, and if you've lived with the fool, if you've had a sibling who's been a fool, you've grown up in the family of parents who were fools. You've worked for a company led by fools, and now you're looking for work. Everybody else around the fool suffers. And they don't want to see it. They want to continue to live life with the idea, well, as long as I can get away with it, as long as I can live, I'm okay. And we miss how much harm we're causing the people that we say we love. That's the real issue with the fool. Well, let's talk a little bit about the scoffer. Again, like the fool, they know the difference between right and wrong, and they have chosen to do their own thing. But here's the difference. The difference is they have chosen to be critical of everyone else doing right. It's not enough just to hear some difference of opinion. They've got to tell them why they're wrong. And nobody ever wants to be around the scoffer. Maybe three ways of looking at this instead of the naive, the fool, and the scoffer. Is they're the clueless, they're the careless, and they're the critical. Maybe you want to write those words down on the back of your bulletin to help you remember this. And the problem is with that critical, critical way that the scoffer leads life. They'll alienate everyone around them. They can get through enough life with their power, their money, their influence over others that things go well to them for a long time. But at some point, they're going to need wisdom. So what's the solution when you deal with the scoffer? When you've got to deal with the guy in this chair? Here's what the Bible says. There isn't one. Proverbs doesn't describe, here's a, here's a foolproof way to deal with the scoffer in your life. They're just, they're unapproachable. And the only thing you can do is to drive them from your midst. And that sounds harsh. Everybody understands, well, shouldn't we just love everybody and, and everybody needs a second chance? Well, sure. But chances are for the scoffer in your life, it's going to take somebody else coming into their lives besides you to help bring some wisdom in that they can't find. It's not that grace or forgiveness is unavailable if you're sitting in one of these three chairs. Please understand that. It's not that God has written any one of these three off and said, not anymore. But here's where the issue comes in. It's almost impossible to receive it when you sit in one of these three chairs. Forgiveness and grace, they're just not even like you can see it. For those who have sat in one of these chairs for too long, 
If they were to pick up a Bible, they wouldn't even know where to look. They haven't been seeking after God, and so prayers are ineffective. It just, it's like it's unavailable. But there is something. The writer of Proverbs says that eventually everyone who is naive, a fool, or a scoffer needs wisdom. Everybody at some point needs wisdom. For the person who's naive and all of a sudden, they're thinking about getting married. For the person who's been the fool and they're out of a job and they've got to look for a new one. For the person who's a scoffer and their health isn't going so good and they need some help. And they've driven everybody who ever cared for them away and they're alone. At some point, every person who sat in these chairs needs wisdom. But the Bible says that because they have refused to move, when they need wisdom the most, they will not be able to find it. So my question is, where are you sitting? If you're sitting in one of these chairs in a particular area of your life, how much longer do you want to sit there? Is it time to move? Solomon personified wisdom as a woman who came to town, walked the streets, and asked, will anyone listen to me? Listen to how he put it. From Proverbs chapter 1. Wisdom calls aloud in the street. She raises her voice in the public squares. And at the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. In the gateways of the city, she makes her speech. How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. But since you rejected me when I called, and no one gave heed when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I will turn and laugh at your disaster. Now, this is not God saying that he's going to laugh when troubles come to us. Solomon is personifying the concept of wisdom. It says it's so hard if you've been living in these three chairs. Wisdom says, I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm. When disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind. When distress and trouble overwhelm you. Well, overwhelm you. Then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but will not find me. See, the problem is if you're on the sidelines, it all makes perfect sense. We can all look back at people who have made the mistakes that we have. And it seems so obvious to us now. That's not a wise thing. So the question is, where are you sitting this morning? Is there an area of your life, in your relationships, in your finances, in your marriage, the way you're trying to raise your kids, the way that you're preparing for the future, and the way that you handle your job, are you sitting in one of these three chairs? Are you approaching it saying, well, I just know it's going to work out. I'll figure it out. I got this all wrapped up, and you just you sound like an overprotective parent here. I don't need that. Are you here saying, you know what, you're probably right. There's things in my life that I am just, I just don't care. It may be causing me harm, but I just, I don't care. Or are you over here saying, you know what? That's your way of living. Well, what I've done so far seems to get me by okay, and I'm sure it will forever. So you just keep that to yourself. In fact, I'm going to write you a letter. If you're sitting in one of these three chairs, where would you like to sit? Because the Bible describes an altogether different chair. That we don't have to stay there. We can live a victorious life. We become wise. Proverbs 15.33 says that the fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom and humility comes before honor. Are you ready to admit to God and maybe to some other people to experience humility? 
and say, this isn't working. In this area of my life, I need to make a change. God, I need to begin asking the question, in light of my past experiences, my current situation, my future hopes and dreams, what's the wise thing for me to do in this situation? Not for that person, not for everybody, but for me. What is the wise thing to do? And I pray you'll have the courage to begin asking that question. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning I thank you for your great love. I thank you for the words that we read in your Bible, your gift to teach us life. That we don't have to stay in these chairs. We don't have to continue going through life suffering the consequences of wrong choices. We don't have to look back in our gray years with regret. God, you've given us the tools. Your word doesn't describe every situation we'll face, but you've given us the question that if we asked it, has the power to foolproof our lives. Give us the courage, Lord, to begin asking the question, what is the wise thing to do? To stop asking the question that everybody else asks of, well, does the Bible have something against it? Well, is it legal here in America to do that? Well, is everybody else getting away with it? Not is it moral, is it right, is it wrong, but is it wise? Father, as we do that and we live our lives, I thank you for the promises that we see in your word of your love. I thank you, Lord, for the promises we see as we trust in you in the area of our finances, that you know our needs and that you love us. So help us come with boldness as we give to you a tithe and an offering that you would give us wisdom as a church, Lord, to know what is the wise thing to do in our community as we serve you and around the world as we partner with others to serve you. Grant us your wisdom, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.